This is Bob Capetta from the University of Illinois at Chicago. And this lesson is a collection of exercises looking at parametric and polar equations. First, we're asked to eliminate the parameter. And the parametric equation is x of t is 3 plus 1 over t, and y of t is t cubed plus 7. So we're going to solve for one of the t's. So looking at x as 3 plus 1 over t, subtracting 3 from both sides, we get x minus 3 is 1 over t. How to solve for t? Take the reciprocal of both sides. The reciprocal of the right side is t. The reciprocal of the left side is 1 over x minus 3. So now I get 1 over x minus 3 is t, and I can plug that into this equation. So y of t is t cubed plus 7. Plugging 1 over x minus 3 in for t, we get y is 1 over x minus 3 cubed plus 7, and I have successfully eliminated the parameter. I could simplify this a little bit, of course. 1 to the third power is just 1. x minus 3 to the third power would be in the denominator. So we get y equals 1 over x minus 3 cubed plus 7. We started with a parametric equation, and then we've eliminated the parameter t, and we have an equation in x and y. Next, we're asked to eliminate the parameter where x of t is 2 cos t minus 5, and y of t is 3 sine t plus 1 x is 2 cos t minus 5. Our strategy in the first problem was to solve for t. In this problem, we're going to solve for cosine t. So x plus 5 is 2 cosine t, dividing both sides by 2. x plus 5 divided by 2 is cosine t. With this piece, y of t is 3 sine t plus 1. We will solve for sine t. So y being 3 sine t plus 1, subtracting 1. y minus 1 is 3 sine t, divide by 3 y minus 1 over 3 is sine t. Now, once we have cosine t and sine t, we can use a very important trig identity. That, of course, is cos squared t plus sine squared t is 1. Now, make sure you know what this notation means. Cos squared t means quantity cosine t squared. Sine squared t means quantity sine t squared. And then we can replace cosine t with x plus 5 over 2. We can replace sine t with y minus 1 over 3, at which point we're going to have x plus 5 squared over 4, 2 squared is 4, plus y minus 1 squared over 9 equals 1. And you may recognize that that is an equation of an ellipse. What does that ellipse look like? Centered at negative 5, 1. The span in the x direction is 2. The span in the y direction is 3. So here we go, negative 5, 1. Span in the x direction is 2, 2 over, 2 over. Span in the y direction is 3, up 3, down 3. Now we lose the orientation. We're not sure if this has a clockwise or a counterclockwise orientation. Once we eliminate the parameter, we are no longer able to determine that. We would have had to do that while t was still part of the problem. And one more eliminating the parameter question. x of t is 2 secant t. y of t is 5 tangent t. So x over 2 is secant t, and y over 5 is tangent t. And we have another identity we can use, namely 1 plus tangent squared t is secant squared t. So 1 plus y over 5 quantity squared equals x over 2 quantity squared. 1 plus y squared over 25 is x squared over 4. 1 is x squared over 4 minus y squared over 25. If you were to graph that, that, of course, would be a hyperbola that is centered at 0, 0. So in this case, we start with another parametric equation. x is 5 sine t, and y is 2 cos t. And we're asked to find the slope of the tangent line at the point negative 5 halves comma root 3. So this also will be an ellipse, and the point negative 5 halves root 3 is one of the points on that ellipse, and we are interested in the slope of the tangent line at that point. So I'm starting here with x is 5 sine t, and dx dt, the derivative of sine t, is of course cos t, so dx dt is 5 cos t y is 2 cos t, the derivative of y with respect to t, dy dt would be 2 times the derivative of cosine t, 
2 times negative sine t or negative 2 sine t. Now what do we know? The slope of the tangent is dy dx. So that will be dy dt divided by dx dt. Slope of the tangent dy dt negative 2 sine t over 5 cos t. So we have a formula for the slope of the tangent, but that formula is a function of t. So we need to determine what value of t leads me to this point on the curve. What t value tells me 5 sine t is negative 5 halves and 2 cosine t is root 3. We need to determine that. So if 5 sine t is negative 5 halves dividing both sides by 5, we get sine t is negative 1 half. Now there's actually two answers to that, right? There is a third quadrant answer and a fourth quadrant answer. We just want one of them, so we need to look at the other piece. 2 cosine t is root 3, so cosine t is root 3 over 2. If cosine t is positive and sine t is negative, that puts us in quadrant 4. So the solution for this will be a quadrant 4 solution. Now the reference angle, sine t is a half, and cos t is root 3 over 2, when t is pi over 6. So the fact that sine is negative and cosine is positive puts us in quadrant 4 with a reference angle of pi over 6. So if that's the case, the t that we want is pi over 6 short of 2 pi, or 2 pi minus pi over 6, or 11 pi over 6. So if I plug 11 pi over 6 into this parametric equation, I get the point negative 5 halves comma root 3. And we have the formula for the slope of the tangent line. dy dx is negative 2 sine t over 5 cos t. Substituting 11 pi over 6 into t will give us the slope of the tangent. So sine of 11 pi over 6, that is a fourth quadrant angle. That will have to be negative. Reference angle is 1 half pi over 6, which gives me a sine of 1 half, but it'll be negative, of course. 11 pi over 6 gives me a reference angle of pi over 6. Fourth quadrant cosine is positive. Cosine of pi over 6 is root 3 over 2. So we get 1 over 5 root 3 over 2, which of course would be 2 over 5 root 3 when we divide those fractions. That will be the slope of the tangent line for this parametric pair at the point negative 5 halves root 3. Next, we're going to be given some problems in polar form. We want to convert them to rectangular form. So a few things to remember. x squared plus y squared is r squared. We get that from the triangle. Tangent of theta is y over x, also from the triangle. x is r cosine theta, and y is r sine theta. So keep all those rules in mind. Now, r equals 10 sine theta looks challenging, but it'll be much simpler if we multiply both sides by r. Multiplying the left side by r, we get r squared. Multiplying the right side by r, we get 10 r sine theta. r squared is x squared plus y squared. r sine theta is y. So we get x squared plus y squared equals 10y, and that is in rectangular form. You could subtract 10y, you could complete the square to get it in standard form for a circle, but that's what that circle looks like. You can see where the center of that circle is, you can see what the radius is. Radius is going to be uh, 5, so we're going from 5 to 10, and from 0 to 5, radius is 5, center is 0, 5. Next question to convert to rectangular form, we have r equals 2 cosecant theta. Well, cosecant theta is the same as 1 over sine theta. Multiplying both sides by sine, we get r sine theta is 2. Remember, r cosine theta is x, r sine theta is y. So this equation is simply y equals 2, which will be a horizontal line with a height of 2. Next, we want to graph. We want to do a polar graph of r equals 8 times the cosine of theta. To do that, we are going to need a bunch of points. I like to start with 0 radians, pi over 6, which of course is 30 degrees, pi over 4, which is 45, pi over 3, which is 60 degrees, and pi over 2, which is 90. And looking at all of those values first. 
So cosine of 0 is 1. 8 times 1 is 8. So when theta is 0, r is 8. Cosine of pi over 6 is root 3 over 2. 8 times root 3 over 2 is 4 times the square root of 3. And just so we can help graph it, we'll get a little approximation for that. That's about 6.9. If we go to pi over 4, 45 degrees. Cos of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. It gives me 4 times the square root of 2, which is 5.7 approximately. Cosine of pi over 3 is a half. 8 times a half is 4. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. 8 times 0 is 0. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 points for us to work with here. And let's at least do another set for the second quadrant. So if I go beyond pi over 2, how about 2 pi over 3? Reference angle of that is pi over 3, but in the second quadrant, cosine is negative. So same reference angle as pi over 3, but 1 half becomes negative 1 half because we're in the second quadrant, and we get negative 4 here. Same thing with 3 pi over 4. Reference angle is pi over 4, but in the second quadrant, cosine is negative. So 8 times negative root 2 over 2, negative 4 root 2, about negative 5.7. 5.6 will behave like pi over 6. Same reference angle, but again, in the second quadrant, cosine is negative. So 8 times negative root 3 over 2, negative 4 root 3, or negative 6.9. And then we finish with pi. Cosine of pi is negative 1. 8 times negative 1 is negative 8. So we have these four points all with negative values for r. That's going to be a little tricky for us. Let's think about how we're going to graph those. So here's all of the points we looked at on the previous table. And let's look at where these things graph. First one, if theta is 0, r is 8. 5, 6, 7, 8. Theta is 0, r is 8. Pi over 6, 30 degrees. Each one of these on my graph here is 15 degrees. So two of these radial lines will give me to 30 degrees or pi over 6. And I've got to go to 6.9. This is 5, that is 6, this is 7. You can see that dot very, very close to 7, hence 6.9. Next up is pi over 4, 15, 30, 45 degrees, and we are going out to 5.7. So again, this circle is 5, and this one is 6, so you see that point at 5.7. Pi over 3, 45 plus 15 degrees is 60. We go out to 4, that's 5 units from the center, that's 4. So that dot is directly on the line. There, we get to pi over 2 here, and the radius is 0. Now, you'll notice for any theta, if r is 0, you land here at this point, which we call the pole. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 points, and we may be getting an idea what the shape of this graph is. Now, once I go to 2 pi over 3, so that's 30 degrees beyond 90, what that tells me is we want an answer of negative 4. So if I have negative 4, this is the positive direction. This is the negative direction, 1, 2, 3, 4. So 2 pi over 3 up here, backing up 4 units to negative 4 to land in this spot right here. 3 pi over 4, 45 degrees, 15, 30, 45. Backs up to negative 4 again. 15, 30, 45 is here. There's the positive direction, the negative direction coming back this way. Negative 5 here, negative 5.7, boom. Similarly with 5 pi over 6, 15, 30, 45, 60, pi over, uh, 5 pi over 6, we're backing up negative 6.9, and you can see there's 5, 6, 7 there. And once I'm at pi, all the way back to negative 8, and it is the exact same point we started with there, which is 0, 8. So maybe you can see the relationship here. What will this be? This, of course, is going to be a circle. And we could even figure out what the equation of that circle would be. If you multiply both sides by r, r squared is 8r cos theta. r squared, x squared plus y squared is 8r cos theta is 8x. And indeed, that would be an equation of a circle. Now, looking at this circle, the next question we're going to ask is to find the slope of the tangent at theta is pi over 6. Now, let's just look at this. Pi over 6, 15 degrees, 30 degrees. Here is pi over 6. And you can see the slope of the tangent there will indeed be negative. So let's see if that's what we get with our example. 
you remember x is r cosine theta and y is r sine theta. We want to rewrite this in parametric form, although we're given it in polar form. So r is 8 cos theta, x is r cos theta. So x would be 8 cos theta cos theta. And y is r sine theta, so y would be 8 cos theta sine theta. Now, polar form is r's and thetas. Parametric form is x, y's, and t's. This is a combination of both. So I'm just going to go ahead and rewrite the thetas as t's so that I have it written in the standard parametric form. Now to find the slope of the tangent, we need what? We need dy dx. And dy dx would be dy dt dx dt. So simplifying this guy, of course, x of t is 8 cos squared t. y of t, we'll write the sign first. That's just a little bit more standard. And I need to find the derivatives. Again, dy dt will be the derivative of y with respect to t. dx dt is the derivative of x with respect to t. dy dx will be dy dt divided by dx dt. So dx dt, 2 cosine t times negative sine t using the chain rule. So 2 times 8, 16 times cos t times the derivative of the inside times negative sine t. So let's write that as negative 16 sine t cos t. On this side, we need to use the product rule. I'll need a u and I'll need a v. So I'm letting u be 8 sine t. The derivative with respect to t of 8 sine t is 8 cosine t. Letting v be cos t and v prime would be negative sine t. Remember, product rule, u prime v, 8 cos t cos t, plus u v prime plus 8 sine t times negative sine t which of course becomes 8 cos t cos t minus 8 sine t sine t. And we should make that look a little prettier. So 8 cos squared t minus 8 sine squared t is dy dt. dx dt negative 16 sine t cos t. dy dx is dy dt divided by dx dt. So dy dt up here, 8 cos squared t minus sine squared t over dx dt over negative 16 sine t cos t. And I am interested in the slope of the tangent at theta equals pi over 6. So plug pi over 6 in for all of the t's. So cos squared t means cos t squared, cos of pi over 6 squared, sine squared t means sine of t squared, sine of pi over 6 squared. Now the sine of pi over 6 is a half. We have a half here and a half there. The cos of pi over 6 is root 3 over 2, a root 3 over 2 here and a root 3 over 2 there. Root 3 squared is 3, 2 squared is 4, 8 times 3 quarters, a half squared is a quarter. So that's the interesting part. The bottom, of course, is relatively easy as well. 8 times 3 quarters is 6, 8 times 1 quarter is 2. So upstairs we have 6 minus 2. Downstairs, 16 over 4, negative 4 root 3, by simplifying that fraction. 6 minus 2 is 4. So we have 4 over negative 4 root 3, which of course is 1 over negative root 3, or negative 1 over root 3. So that's what we say is our slope of our tangent line. Does that seem reasonable given our... And sure enough, here is our picture. There is pi over 6, negative 1 over root 3. That's about negative 1 over 1 1.7. And that seems like that could be about right. So we have a visual that at least makes us think that our answer is reasonable. Okay, our next question is, given r equals 3 sine 2 theta, we want to find the area of one petal of the rose. So we drew a graph of the previous problem. This time I'll go ahead and provide the graph of the function r equals 3 times sine of 2 theta. You'll notice there's four petals that we can see. We want to get one petal of the rose, so let's focus on this one of the first quadrant. So what are the values of theta that I need? Maybe it's obvious here where theta starts. And as we move through, where are our pictures and what happens when we get back to the starting point, back to the pole? Well, we can do this by looking at the algebra. I want to see when is this graph at zero? When is the distance from the center zero here? And then it goes around, and it comes back, and it's here again. 
So I want to find the first two places where this polar graph is at zero. So of course sine 2 theta has to be zero, but what do we know? What is sine zero? Sine of zero is zero, and sine of pi is zero. So if that's the case, 2 theta could be zero, because sine of zero is zero, or 2 theta could be pi, because sine of pi equals zero. Well, dividing both sides by 2, then we get theta is 0 divided by 2, 0, or theta is pi divided by 2. So those will be the beginning point and end points for my integral. To find the area of this pedal, I have to integrate from 0 to pi over 2. But you need to remember, for a polar graph, the area of the polar graph is the integral of 1 half r squared d theta. Because for areas of polar graphs, the sector is the geometric model that best describes that. Well, our function on the previous page was 3 sine 2 theta squared. Well, of course, 3 squared is 9. Sine of 2 theta squared is sine squared 2 theta. And then 1 half times 9 is 9 halves. So that could be brought in front of that integral sign. And we have the areas 9 halves times the integral from 0 to pi over 2, our starting point and our ending point for that first petal of the rows, times sine squared of 2 theta d theta. Now, whenever you see the integral of sine squared or the integral of cosine squared, you must go back to the double angle identity for cosine. So I'll start with this version. Cosine of 2z is cosine squared z minus sine squared z. We need the integral of sine squared something. So I'm going to keep sine squared, and I'm going to rewrite cos squared in terms of sine squared. Well, we know cos squared is 1 minus sine squared. So now I could say cosine of 2z is 1 minus sine squared z minus sine squared z, or 1 minus 2 sine squared z. And my goal was to integrate sine squared z, so I have to get sine squared z by itself. Move the 2 sine squared z to the left side, move the cos 2z to the right side. So that positive 2 sine squared z equals 1 minus cos 2z. And then we can divide both sides by 2. To have sine squared z is 1 minus cos 2z over 2. Or as I prefer to write it, uh, well, with thetas. So I have sine squared of 2 theta. Wherever I have a z, replace it with 2 theta, since that's what I need for my previous problem. Sine squared 2 theta is 1 minus the cosine of 2 times 2 theta. So sine squared of 2 theta is 1 minus cosine of 4 theta over 2. Or 1 over 2, 1 half minus 1 half cos 4 theta. That is our result for sine squared of 2 theta, and that's what we'll use to finish our integral. So we were here in terms of our setup. We're going to replace sine squared 2 theta d theta, which with 1 half minus 1 half cos 4 theta d theta. Now I have two integrals. I have the integral of a half d theta minus the integral of a half cos 4 theta d theta. Pulling the constants out in front, we get 9 halves times a half integral of d theta minus 9 half times a half integral of cos 4 theta d theta. In both cases, integrals from 0 to pi over 2. Well, this first piece is what I'm going to focus on. That, of course, is 9 fourths integral from 0 to pi over 2 d theta minus integral of 9 fourths integral from 0 to pi over 2 of cos 4 theta d theta. The integral of 1 d theta is just theta. So this first piece will be 9 fourths of theta as theta ranges from 0 to pi over 2. So this first piece is 9 fourths of pi over 2 minus theta, or 9 fourths of pi over 2, which gives me 9 pi over 8. So that first piece is finished, and now we have to go ahead and do the second piece, which will require u substitution. So you need to recognize that the endpoints are thetas. Theta is going from 0 to pi over 2. I want u to be 4 theta. Then the derivative of u with respect to theta is 4. Multiplying by d theta, du is 4 d theta. du divided by 4 is d theta. So this will become cosine of u 
DU over 4, yet I strongly suggest that you change the endpoints. If theta is 0, what is U? 4 times 0, U is just 0. If theta is pi over 2, what is U? 4 times pi over 2, or 2 pi. So theta being DU over 4 enables me to pull that 4 out in front. So that's really a 1 quarter. 9 fourths times 1 quarter would be 9 sixteenths. And then 4 times 0 is 0. 4 times pi over 2 is 2 pi. Cos u du. Now maybe you can think about this. The graph of cosine u from 0 to 2 pi, what's the area under that curve? Some of it's above the axis, some of it's below the axis. The antiderivative of cosine u, of course, is sine u. So we will take minus 9 sixteenths sine u as u goes from 0 to 2 pi. But boy, that's kind of nice. Sine 2 pi minus sine 0. Sine 2 pi is 0. Sine 0 is 0. So the reality is all I'm left with is 9 pi over 8. And remember, we looked at the integral from 0 to 2 pi of cos u du. Thinking of the graph of the cosine u, it should not surprise you that that area from 0 to 2 pi of cos u would be 0. Similar to the arrow from area from 0 to 2 pi of sine u is also 0. And that will conclude this lesson.